So, uh, Josh, in the last segment, you basically walked through the different scenarios in which impeachment could uh, begin and processes it could follow. One would be just uh, oversight committees, judicial committees, uh, investigating the myriad of different things that uh, should be investigated in the Trump administration. The second would be a uh, initial uh, impeachment um, uh, inquiry, inquiry, which would then determine whether hearings were necessary, and then they would kick that bill out to uh, judiciary, and they would start uh, to to begin uh, hearings or go directly to hearings. And then I guess the other alternative is just do nothing and hope everything gets better. Um, yeah, and, and beat them in 2020. Right. Well, but and these are not mutually exclusive by any means. I think some people would argue, um, and, and, and let's maybe address that, is, well, well I, before we get to the political implications about it one way or another, what's the argument to do this impeachment in terms of, like, government, in terms of, of holding people to account? I think it's twofold. Since the Mueller report came out, and with Democrats showing that they're wary of impeachment, Trump has become even more lawless, even expressed even more disdain for the checks and balances, the uh, c- Congress's oversight role. He has ordered multiple people to violate the law. He told his DHS nominee, then the head of CPB, that if he violated the law and and got in trouble, Trump would pardon him. This is very serious stuff from the President of the United States, and they're sending a signal by by downplaying the possibility of impeachment that he he can get away with all of this. And you know, the classic formula in law enforcement is that impunity breeds more lawlessness, right? right? Think about broken windows theory. Um, The other point is that... Or Iran-Contra, or savings and loan, or or the pardoning from uh, Watergate. Yes. Uh, Or or impunity for human rights violators. I mean, this is, you know, pretty well understood. Yes. Yeah. Um, And then the other thing is it sends a signal to future presidents that uh, impeachment is too politically fraught, and they don't have to worry about it unless the other party has overwhelming majorities in both chambers of Congress, which is unlikely to happen given how closely divided we are. So I think it sets a very bad precedent. You know, there's one, one argument that I think is salient is that the, the founders, I mean, if you get into the constitutional issues here, the founders did not give us many options, a wide array of options to deal with a lawless president. They foresaw the possibility, and they gave us basically oversight and impeachment. So I think that it's important to look at this in the context of what's happening now. This is not just about what Robert Mueller found. The lawlessness and contempt for the other branches of government is happening right now, and I, and I think it's escalating. And Trump has said repeatedly that he feels that the Supreme Court is a backstop for him. So, you know, you don't have the check from the judicial branch necessarily. Right. This is what we have. Okay. So um, in terms of, I guess, the, um, I don't know if I would call it uh, the, the moral compunction, but the ethical compulsion uh, to impeach, let's talk about the political realities. I mean, I think there is a sense that the Democratic leadership uh, is afraid of impeachment. The um, Very often we see our politicians operate under the uh, lessons of the, you know, uh, metaphorically speaking, the last war. Uh, yes. Bill Clinton, when he was impeached, um, it helped his popularity in many respects. I mean, I think there's really no other way to to assess that. Um, w- w- what's the political argument? And give it to us whether you think that political argument is even relevant in light of the sort of the ethical argument. Yeah, I mean, so first of all, I think that it's it's, you're exactly right to say that they're fighting the last war. Um, Bill Clinton, we can look back on Bill Clinton's presidency in retrospect. And 
find a lot of problems. But it doesn't change the simple fact that in late 1998, Bill Clinton had a 64% approval rate, 35% disapproved. That's a net approval of plus 29 points. Very, very popular presidency at the time. In the previous 17 Gallup polls that year, his approval had dropped under 60% in three of them, 57, 58%. So you're talking about kind of the peak of his popularity. Trump, on the other hand, is consistently at minus 10 net approval. He's been that way for two and a half years. And the other big difference is that, you know, they went after Clinton for lying about having sex with, which, you know, if we're honest, I think most adults have done at one point or another. And this is about obstructing justice um, and abusing the office of the presidency. And those are things that we haven't all done at some point. So I think that it's just a sloppy or superficial um, analog. Fair enough. Okay. And so, uh, and, and I think, look, the arguments as to whether it would help or hurt uh, cut both ways. Here is my question for you. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, and I'm still, I think, formulating my opinion, but I, there's no doubt in my mind that we're, we're already – you know, walking down the path of impeachment. I mean, the, you know, it's possible all these investigations will turn up nothing and maybe we'll get none of this information. But uh, in one form or another, and I think you have a compelling argument that to use the word impeachment, even if it's just an inquiry, is going to sort of elevate uh, the importance of this investigations in the public's mind. We just have about a minute and a half left. Here is uh, my question to you. Is there a danger that you uh, you do the uh, impeachment process. Again, I, I think that seems to me to be a, a wise course. But if you hold the vote to impeach before the election, and regardless of how it comes out, we know it's not going to go anywhere in the Senate, like you said. Um, what if Trump wins the election again? Let's just assume it's a neutral impact on his election uh, uh, turns. Uh, the impeachment, one way or another, we can't measure it. But what if he wins? What do the Democrats have in their quiver left for the second term? That's my fear. Well, I mean, I, I think that the prospect of a second term is itself terrifying. And I, I don't know that it would be materially worse if they tried to hold him account and failed before that. Well, they can't, can, can they go back? I mean, or a, can they, I imagine they could, but B would they in 2021, uh, bring impeachment hearings against this guy, even if there was more information that came out. I mean, it seems to me that the politics of that would be extremely fraught. And mm -hmm. if we know democratic leadership and their, institutional um, concerns, I would say it's extremely unlikely. It's, it's certainly possible. There's nothing that precludes them from doing so. It's not like double jeopardy. Right. But uh, yeah, I, I would think that that would not happen. And I would also think that, you know, the, the new information that might be revealed is not as serious as the repeated attempts to obstruct justice that um, we found here. And also, the refusal to comply with um, with congressional oversight. That's a one-two punch that I think is very powerful. Well, and so my view is that they can damage him in hearings while the presidential candidates, the Democratic presidential candidates, talk about what they want to do for the country. And it's, Joshua it's Holland, I have a feeling this is a conversation we can have again soon. I appreciate your time today. 